Welcome to Harvest Fellowship this morning. Let's stand and worship together.
Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful that you are more than everything that we could possibly. Thank you for your grace, your everlasting love, for the fact that you give us everything we need for life and godliness. You call it yourself. You heal us from our wounds. You forgive us of our sins. You offer us strength and courage to move forward to what needs to be done against our old nature because you've given us a new one. This morning as we come to you burdened and broken and filled with joy, maybe scared, maybe worried about the future, maybe anxious, the different things that burden us, the different things that we carry, the weights we carry that no one sees, you're there to lift those from us. You're there to empower us with everything that we need to conquer everything we need to trust you to resolve that which we can't solve ourselves. Take those things from us this morning. Give us what we need as we trust in you, as we rest in you, as we cry out to you, as we call to your name. That this could be a time where you are praised and worshiped because of the work we've already seen you do and the work you have yet to do. So take this time, do what only you can. Soften us to your call for conviction and repentance and for courage. That we can rest in you and proclaim your goodness. Thank you for who you are. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory, and we lift up your name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated for just a moment. We're just going to focus just a little bit this morning on the goodness of God. And Alexis is going to share with us wonderful truth.
good your love reaches to the skies your faithfulness to mountain heights and your mercy is never ending sing that lord you are so good your love reaches to the skies your faithfulness to mountain heights
tua I think Art had a good time on that song. <laughs> Thank you. You can be seated. Our kids can head on back to children's worship. I don't think Art was the only one that had a good time. <laughs> Amen. Isn't it good to come and be in the room with a bunch of believers who trust in the Lord? Amen. You know, can, can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? It's going to be one perpetual party forever and ever and ever and ever around the throne of God. I guess you understand the theme this morning has kind of been around the goodness of God, right? Kind of hard to miss that. Even though that is true, you know and I know because we live in this world that not everything we endure, not everything we encounter is good, right? But that doesn't lessen the fact that we can praise God even in the midst of tough times. I want to just mention a few names this morning and pray for them before we actually jump into the message today. I want you to think about Carl Hinkle this morning. Think about Mr. Paul Wookie, Sam Deshay. I want you to think about Lois's mother. Uh, she's in the hospital with some pneumonia. There have been several others that I've heard from and heard about this week that, that need a special touch from the Lord. We're in here praising God, and they're struggling. Some of you may look good on the outside. You may have all the, the struggle covered up this morning, cleaned up, doctored up, beautified. But inside, your life is in a knot. You're struggling. Let's pray. Father, in times like these, Lord, we, uh, we realize there are some good days, there are some bad days, there are some hard times, there are some good times. We know, Lord, that's the way life is. I pray for these that I just mentioned. Because, Lord, even though the sun is shining and even though things look hopeful for them, there's a struggle in the midst of their storm right now. We know about that. Some days, Lord, we have to go through the same kind of thing. Your word tells us that. But it also tells us, Lord, we can trust in you. And I pray that we will learn how to do that better and better and better with every day that we live. You're an awesome God. You're alive. You're well. You're powerful. There's no limitation to what you can do. We have all of your promises. We have your presence. And right now, Lord, we come into that presence. We ask you to feed us with your word. Truth makes a difference. As we learn to trust in you, Lord, we can find the comfort we need. And I pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to look, first of all, this morning at a psalm. I want you, if you have your notes, to look in psalms, at Psalms 20. If you have a Bible want to make some notes in it, please do. Psalms 20 is an interesting psalm. It was written by King David, written at a time when most likely they were facing some very difficult days as a nation of people. It's not just a song, but it's a prayer that he prayed for his people and also for himself. And in fact, it is a prayer that we could consider 
as a call to prayer. With trouble outside the gate, David said pray. I don't want to make this statement in any way that you consider it to be a political statement, but our nation is in trouble. We've gone so far from where we were when I grew up. And, and we need to be praying. I, I encourage each and every one of you to come and participate, especially on Wednesday nights as we gather every other Wednesday night for times of prayer. We're learning about prayer. We're praying. We're, we're trying to intercede for, for ourselves and for God's uh, people and for our nation and for the things that need a special touch for him from him look at what David wrote may the Lord answer you when you're in distress that word could be trouble of any kind may the name of the God of Jacob protect you and may he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion may he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings in other words, may he accept your worship. May he give you the desires of your heart and make all of your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and, and will lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Notice the change in verse 6. He says, now I know. That the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall. But we rise up and stand firm. O Lord, save the king and answer us when we call. When we call. There are many commentators that suggest that Psalms 20 is a plea for God's protection in a time of trouble, a time of approaching trouble. And then Psalm 21 is a praise for God's provision in overcoming that trouble. When you read those two Psalms back to back, it's very easy to see that that is true. Psalms 20 is a strong encouragement for God's people to call out to him through prayer so that he will answer them in their day of trouble when they call out to him so that he will defend them and help them in their need, giving them all the strength that they need and granting them their, their, the desire of their heart and making all of their plans succeed. It's real simple when you read this song. It's, it's simple to see that prayer is the key to success. Not just the success of being successful, but it's, it's the key to comfort. If you want a heart that is comforted, you need to be a praying person. To be comforted is to receive strength. It's to find hope. It's to be consoled. Now, Junior Hill, who was one of the great evangelists early on when I was a young man, said how refreshing it is to hear the heart cries of desperate people, those who are wise enough to know from whence cometh their help and bold enough to earnestly cry out for it. It's very clear that the psalmist understood that the first step in receiving what God could do for us or for them is for them to collectively renounce what they can do for themselves. Think about that. As long as you do for yourself and don't trust in God, you're going to miss out on what God can do for you. The Bible says that no one will ever experience the saving power of God's right hand as long as he or she is trusting in anything but God. Some of you today are trusting in what mom and dad can do for you. That's right. And you're adults. Some of you may be trusting in the federal government or in a political party. You may be trusting in your own strength and ability or the money that you saved up and put in the bank. You might be trusting in your retirement that you have banked over the years or maybe what Social Security could do for you. David said some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
Someone wisely said in the midst of troubles, some by crutches, you know those things you lean on? Some by crutches while others sprout wings. Powerful statement. It comes right out of the heart of Isaiah chapter 40 where he wrote, Have you never heard or understood? Don't you know that the Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows faint or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. He offers strength to the weak. Even youths will become exhausted and young men will give up. But those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not faint. Junior Hill also wrote these words. He said, unfortunately, so many in our day are far too fond of crutches. And those who insist on using them will eventually be brought to their knees and fall. He says, while crutches may help you stand right up when you have fallen, trusting in the name of the Lord will help you to stand up right before you have fallen. Isn't that a better position to be in? Amen. Well, if you consider Psalms 20 to be a prayer before the battle, then Psalms 21 is to be a prayer after the battle. A prayer that should be prayed by all and lifted up to God. I know of very few things more encouraging to a believer than for them to be able to see God answering their prayers as they've been prayed. Psalms 21 is full of all of that. Almost every verse makes mention of God's grace and mercy that he has lovingly poured out on those who trust in him. Look with me at verse 1, Psalms 20. By the way, this is a royal psalm. For those of you who know anything about the psalms, you understand what I just said. It's a psalm that has messianic or uh, messiah flavor to it, spoken about the Lord. David writes how the king rejoices in your strength, O Lord. He shouts with joy because of your victory. For you have given him his heart's desire. You have held back nothing that he requested. You welcomed him back with success and prosperity. You place a, a, placed a crown of finest gold on his head. He asked you to preserve his life and you have granted his request. The days of his life stretch on forever. Your victory brings him great honor, and you have clothed him with splendor and majesty. You have anointed, or excuse me, you have endowed him with eternal blessing. You have given him the joy of being in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. The unfailing love of the Most High will keep him from stumbling. Now I want you to notice how verse 8 takes a change of course. He goes on to write, you will capture all your enemies. Your strong right hand will seize all those who hate you and you will destroy them as in a flaming furnace when you appear. The Lord will consume them in his anger. Fire will devour them. You will wipe their children from the face of the earth and and they will never have descendants, although they plot against you. Their evil schemes will never succeed. For they will turn and run when they see your arrows aimed at them. He says in verse 13, we praise you, Lord, for all your glorious power. With music and singing, we celebrate your mighty acts. What a joy and privilege it is to be able to worship God. Amen. How beautiful and how comforting it is to see God at work taking care of his people. But not only does this psalm remind us of what God is faithful to do for his people who love and appreciate him, but there's also that section that reminds us of what God has done for those who despise and hate him. We all need to remember that while God's mercy is always extended to those who are willing to receive him and love him and worship him, Likewise, his wrath awaits anyone who despises and rejects him. We, we must never forget what the, the writer of Hebrews wrote in the, the 13th or in the 10th chapter, verse 31. He writes, It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. 
You see, so often we live our lives as if God's not real or as if God's not alive, but he is. He's not an idol that's dead and dumb and can't see and can't hear and can't talk. Our God will one day hold us accountable, whether you're a believer or not a believer. That's what Scripture says. You know, we, we Christians think we get a free pass. No. We're not going to be held accountable for our sin, but we're going to be held accountable for our stewardship of God's blessings, and we must never forget that. Romans chapter 11, verse 22 says, Notice how God is both kind and severe. He, he is severe to those who disobey Him, but kind to you as you continue to trust in His kindness. In fact, Jesus stated that same principle this way in John chapter 14, verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. How many times have you read that? Don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust God, now trust in me. Jesus wanted them to believe in him and trust him, to have total and, and solid faith in who he was and all that he had promised them. And the Bible is clear when you read it about the disciples that they loved him and they, they put their trust in him as much as they knew how, as much as they could. They left everything to follow Jesus. How much have you left? Think about it. They left everything to follow Jesus. That takes a, a, a great deal of trust to be able to do that. But then when Jesus told them about he, the fact that he was going to die and then return to the Father, they became confused and filled with grief and, and dismay and disbelief. And, and in many ways, they were deeply, deeply troubled. It's really hard to imagine what must have been going through their minds. I don't know what they felt. We, we don't know what they felt like. We weren't there. We weren't a part of that group. But even though that's true, it doesn't mean that we ourselves are immune to the troubles and heartaches of life. It, it doesn't take long living in this old fallen sin-cursed world to realize that it's packed with troubles and trials. We all go through them. Being a Christian doesn't make you immune to that reality. It doesn't lessen that reality. And in fact, if you'll just read the Bible, you'll see that in, instead of pretending that troubled times and difficult times don't exist, it's clear that Scripture addresses the hardships of life head on. The Bible talks about Job. Job was, a, was not strain, a, a stranger to life's trauma and suffering. L listen to what he wrote in the 14th chapter of Job. He said, how frail is humanity. How short is life and, and full of troubles like a flower. We, we blossom for a moment and then wither. Like the shadow of a passing cloud, we quickly disappear. And then I want you to notice Jeremiah as well. He was known as the weeping prophet of God, a man of God who preached the word of God on street corners, anywhere he could, preaching what God put on his heart to do. But it left him with a, with a dismal life. I mean, he suffered for doing what God called him to do. L listen to what he wrote in, in chapter 20 of, of Jeremiah. He said, yet I curse the day I was born. You ever said that? I curse the day that I was born. May the day of my birth not be blessed. I curse the, the messenger who told my father, Good news, you have a son. Let him be destroyed like the cities of old, that the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long with battle shouts, for he did not kill me at birth. Oh, that, that I had died in my mother's womb and that her body had been my grave. Why was I ever born? Why was I ever born? My, my entire life has been filled with trouble and sorrow and shame. And, he, and it was all because he was being obedient to God. Even Jesus, who well knew that his followers would face unmerciful troubles in life, said this. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. How many of you have already done that? Sometimes we get up worrying about tomorrow. We go to bed worrying about tomorrow. We get up worrying about the next day and the next day and the next day. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. In other words, you've got enough problems to deal with today. 
I want you to look at how the Apostle Paul spoke to us who are believers, those like you and me. In Acts chapter 14, Luke wrote, After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned again to Lystra and Iconium and, and Antioch of Pisidia where they strengthened the believers. That's that same word, strengthen, is the same word for comfort, where they comforted those believers. Why were they, in, were they comforting them? Because they were going through some difficult times. He says they encouraged them to continue in the faith. Don't give up! Reminding them that they must enter into the kingdom of God through many tribulations. It's not going to be easy. Being a Christian is not a bed of roses. We sometimes think that when we become Christians that everything ought to be good after that. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Life can be and often is tough. But the blessed promise of God's word is that God is known to be the God of comfort. The God of comfort. Look with me at what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I encourage you just to spend some time in this chapter looking at what Paul wrote about God's comfort. He said, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of every mercy and the God who comforts us. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. God desires to comfort us because that is part of who he is. It is what he does. It is part of his character. He is a gracious and compassionate God. He is a God of hope. James wrote, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. Job is an example of a man who endured patiently. From his experience, we see how the Lord's plan finally ended in good, for he is full of tenderness and mercy. I, I don't know if you have this verse, these two verses memorized, but I encourage you to do this because you never know when you're going to need to bring them uh, allow them to be brought to your memory by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to do our part in putting God's word to memory. But notice what verse 27 said, Romans chapter 8. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, pleads for us believers in harmony with our own will. It's not what it said, is it? He pleads for us in harmony with God's own will. He prays not our will be done, but God's will be done. Look at verse 28. And we know that God causes everything, both the good and the bad, to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God will take the mess in your life and turn it out, turn it, turn it into being something wonderful and good for his glory and your good. On the night that Jesus was arrested and before he was crucified the next day, the Bible tells us that he got along with his remaining disciples, minus Judas in the upper room. And you know, as I, as I thought about that this week, I, I tried to put myself in his shoes, trying to understand and imagine the ordeal that he was going through we're talking about a pressure cooker moment, if ever there was one in his life. We know that Jesus was about to accept and carry our sins on his body to the cross. Man, you talk about an excessively heavy load. I, I wonder how, how many of us, if we, we said, okay, get somebody, put them on your shoulders and go to the end of the parking lot and come back, could you make it? Depends on how little they are. Right? But if you had to put the sins of the world on your shoulders and take them to the cross, you wouldn't make it. Jesus barely did. Scholars tell me that he probably had no blood left in his veins by the time he made it to the cross. He was just about gone. That's how cruel that moment was in his life, carrying our sin. Paul said, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 
And then on top of that, Jesus was also facing the reality of being separated from his father for the very first time in eternity. They had always been like this. But when Jesus took our sin on, the, on his shoulders and, and was crucified on the cross, the Father turned his back on the Son for the very first time. And that is why Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look, I used to live fearing that my dad would reject me. Because I was a Christian and he was not. I understand that. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you do. Can you imagine God the Son being turned away and rejected by God the Father in that moment as he took our hell there on the cross? Here's the amazing thing that I see when Jesus did all of that. When Jesus hung there on that cross, he wasn't thinking about his own predicament when he was getting ready to go to the cross. He wasn't thinking about what he was about to go through. He wasn't thinking about his circumstance. He was thinking about you thinking about me you see jesus was was a selfless selfless person he wasn't selfish he was a self-giving person he put his people's needs our needs ahead of his own he cared about you more than he cared about life himself i was listening this week to the radio and i heard a, a survey being actually given and it, it was a recent survey that kind of shocked me but it didn't surprise me they were surveying young adults under 30 and they were asking them how many of you plan to get married and have children over 50 percent said no over 50 percent said no why because they wanted to be able to focus on their own lives they wanted to be able to focus on themselves they weren't interested in having to take care of other people. They, they wanted their life in the way they wanted it. They didn't want mates or kids because they considered them to be a distraction or a hindrance to being who they wanted to be. Talk about selfishness. Had, hadn't things changed? Yeah, tremendously. Selfishness was not the attitude of Jesus Christ. He was selfless not selfish he was completely focused on his disciples knowing that their whole world was about to be shattered into pieces they were already hurting they were confused they were anxious because of the impending death of the Lord and his departure but that was just words what they were about to experience was about to be real real I want you to look with me this morning at what Jesus did to bring comfort in the face of his departure. I think that's important. When you need comfort, you need to know what the Lord did for his disciples. I want you to see that, that comfort is, is spoken of very strongly in these first 14 verses of the 14th chapter of John. Uh, this is a powerful, powerful uh, place in Scripture, and I, and I hope you will spend some time there. It can teach you a whole lot about what God can do for you. I also want you to understand that what Jesus says is not just for those who lived in the past, but it is for us who live in the present. You're going to see that the comfort that you need comes from learning to trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to notice several things. First of all, you can find comfort by trusting in the presence of Jesus. Look at verse 1. He said, don't be troubled. You trust God, now trust in me. Well, how in the world would you define trouble? All depends on who we talk to, right? Some might define it as, well, my car just died. Some of you have had that happen here recently. Some might say, well, I lost my job or my marriage is falling apart. Boy, I've heard that a lot recently. Some might just say, well, I, I just got bad news from the doctor. Things aren't what I expected or wanted. God's Word teaches us that as long as we live in this world, we're going to have troubles, but it also teaches is that trouble doesn't have to trouble us. It doesn't. In this 14th chapter of John, Jesus gathers up his disciples, fully aware of all the trouble that was surrounding his death and, and all the trouble that his disciples would have to face. And in that context, he, he doesn't just make a suggestion. He commands them, don't be troubled. 
Don't be troubled. Don't be blown away. In essence, Jesus was saying, don't get caught up in all the emotion of the moment and the things that you don't understand. Just believe in me and trust me. He was telling his disciples that they could continue to trust in him even when they could not see him with their own eyes. And listen, that was a new thing for them. Jesus knew that this was only going to be able to happen if they changed their focus. And he may be asking you to do the same thing. Friends, our problems? How many here don't have a problem? Anybody here not have a problem? Listen, our, our problems, our, our earthly troubles begin to shrink when we learn not to focus on the problem, but on God's presence and on God's power and on his provision for every day. Paul Purvis said God's prescription for our problem is the promise of his presence both then and now. His presence makes the difference. In those moments when our world seems to be falling apart, we must learn to trust in Jesus. Why? Because he said, believe in me. He said, trust me. He said, I'm doing something that is beyond uh, you, even when you don't see what I'm doing, even when you don't understand, trust me. Trust me, I am with you, even to the ends of the age. In verse 2, I see that you can also find comfort by trusting in the preparation that Jesus has made for you. He said, there are many rooms in my Father's home, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Well, he mentions the Father's house. We know that to be a reference to heaven. The Bible describes heaven in a number of ways. It describes it as a country due to its vastness. He describes it, the Bible describes it as a city because of its large number of inhabitants. It is described as a kingdom because Jesus is going to be the king of heaven. Amen. He describes it as a paradise because of its incredible beauty. It is also described as a place of rest because once we get there, not now, but once we get there, we will be free from our old sin nature. I'm ready to get rid of mine. I hope you are. We're going to be free of our old sin nature. We're going to be free of sin. We're not going to have to deal with the devil anymore, nor this old, evil, sinful, fallen world that wants to come against us in every way. I want you to think about this. If you can put this in your mind, hold on to it, think about it. When you need it, it it'll, it'll pay dividends for you, I promise you. But think about this. Christian, Jesus, who was known as a carpenter, that was his trade, has gone ahead of us to prepare an eternal home for us in heaven. Does that excite you? It should. I mean, think about it. It took only six days for God to create the universe. And I know some of you are going, there he goes. Listen, if God is God, he can create everything in six days just like he could spend two million years doing it or two billion years god can do anything he wants to i believe he created it in six days you can believe what you want to believe okay i believe he created it in six days and if he if that's true you just think about this he's been gone for the last two thousand years preparing you a place to exist for eternity man can you imagine how beautiful that's going to be i mean if you think your house or subdivision is nice just wait till you see what god lives in I'm serious. It's going to be awesome what God is living in. And the beautiful thing, we, we can find great comfort in the fact that we're going to live in a, in a part of that house with him. What an awesome thing that's going to be. I find great comfort in the fact that Jesus is going to give us a really nice place to live in in heaven. But listen, before you can see that become a reality, you first happen to have to open up your heart and give him a place a home in your heart. You don't get into heaven unless he's gotten into your heart. Have you done that? Seriously, have you done that? If you have, one of these days you're going to go into his presence and you're going to inherit a mansion made for royalty. When that time comes, 
when the rapture takes place or when you pass from this life, you can have no fear. You have a home prepared for you in heaven. What a beautiful thought. I move on in Scripture and see that there's great comfort found in trusting the proclamation of Jesus. Look at verse 4. And you know where I'm going, Jesus said, and how to get there. But, but Thomas said, no, Lord, we don't. We haven't any idea where you're going, and, and, and so how can we even know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Friends, I do not want to complicate these verses. I do not. It is really simple. It is a simple truth that I don't want you to miss. You know, there's a modern day belief out there that says you can get to heaven through a lot of different paths. You can get to heaven by believing a lot of different things. I want you to understand that's a lie from the pits of hell. That's a satanic lie. It's not the truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth and the way. No one gets to the Father except through me. The Bible teaches emphatically and unapologetically that Jesus Christ is the only way into heaven. When Peter preached his first message, he, he focused on that in Acts chapter 4, verse 11. He said, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected. Think about that. You know, I, I used to, I mixed mud for a guy one time who laid bricks. I didn't last but about three days. <laughs> you know, you, 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 if you got a good brick layer, he'll work you to death. But anyway, when you got a bad brick, he would toss it off to the side. Think about that. The, 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 the Jewish people tossed Jesus to the side thinking he's not the Messiah. But then God picked him up and said, no, I'm going to make him the cornerstone. He's where it all starts. Look at what it says. He is the stone that you builders rejected, the, or, you, you builders rejected, has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. Simple truth. You want to find comfort? Put your trust in Jesus. He is the one who can get you to the Father. Looking on in verse 7, I see that the greatest comfort is found in trusting in the person of Christ. Jesus said some amazing words here. He said, if you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. But Philip, one of those disciples, said, Lord, if you'll just show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. Just let us see him and we'll be okay. But Jesus replied, Philip, don't you even yet know who I am? Even after all the time that I've been with you, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see him? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own, but the Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of what you have seen me do. When I was reading this the other day, I, I thought of a, a scripture verse in Hebrews chapter 13. It's, I think it'll help you to understand what Jesus is trying to uh, get across to these disciples the writer of hebrews said don't forget to show hospitality to strangers in other words there may be an occasion when somebody you've never met before needs your help he said don't forget to show hospitality to them uh, to these strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing some of those people in your past may have been angels. And guess what? You didn't even realize what you were doing. Well, I think the point is, Jesus is saying, <laughs> that may be the way it is with me and you. He said, these disciples, I mean, think about this. The, the disciples that walked with Jesus didn't really realize who he was. They had no clue who he was. They thought he was a, was a man, was a great teacher. For a long time, that's all they believed he was. 
So what did Jesus do? He, he pointed them back to the truth about who he was, the fact that Jesus is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. The statement that he made clearly claimed full deity and equality with the Father. I was reading John MacArthur's commentary about this the other day, and this is his comment. He said Jesus is the way to God because what? He is God. He is not merely a manifestation of God. He is God's manifestation. That truth is the watershed that divides truth from false views of Christ. Many throughout history and today have regarded Jesus as nothing more than a good man, an exemplary, virtuous, moral, and religious teacher. But that is impossible, he says. For no one who claimed to be God incarnate, if his claim were false, could be a good man. If he knew his claim was false, then he would be an evil deceiver. And if, if, he, sincere, uh, if he sincerely believed it is true when it was not, he would be a raving lunatic. But the evidence conclusively shows that Christ was neither a liar nor insane. Rather, he was God. He was God exactly who he claimed to be. I, uh, I was reminded of something Jesus said that is very important here. He came as God for you to see and accept. You need to pay heed to that. Jesus said, that is why I said to you that you will die in your sin, for unless you believe that I am who I say I am, then you will die in your sins. Do you understand what that looks like? That means you will die standing one day before God with sin on your soul, not being acceptable or allowed to be in the presence of God, not being able to come into heaven. But if you'll trust him, trust in his presence and his provision, he'll take care of you now. There, there's no com comfort in dying with sin on your soul, but there is in trusting in the person of Jesus Christ and who he says he is. Something else I see as I conclude in, in verse 12 is that God's comfort is also, it also comes simply by trusting in his promise. Look at verse 12. Jesus said, the truth is anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You ask, you can ask anything in my name, anything, and I will do it. Because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Yes, as anything in my name, and I will do it. How many of you have ever used the word abracadabra? As a kid, did you ever make yourself a little wand and get you a little hat? and Abracadabra. Now, where did we get that from? We watched it on TV. We watched magician, magicians using that. But do you know what it means? Do you have any idea? Its origin and true meaning is debatable even today. But its most accepted meaning is simply this. I will create when I speak. I will create when I speak. Webster defines it this way. It, it defi he defines abracadabra as a word that is supposed to have magical powers. He also defines it as foolish and meaningless talk. As gibberish. That doesn't mean anything. I, I, I bring that up because how many of us have ended our prayers with the phrase, in Jesus' name, thinking that it were some kind of magical phrase? Thinking that if I will just say at the end of my prayer, in Jesus' name, that I'll get what I want. Have we ever done that? Sure we have. Have you ever prayed using that phrase at the end of your prayer and then didn't get what you asked for and wondered why? Or have you ever prayed and forgot to say that and then thought later, well, I didn't get what I want because I didn't put that phrase at the end of my prayer? Sure you are. MacArthur says to ask in Jesus' name does not mean to frivolously tack the words in Jesus' name on to the end of the prayer. It is not a magical formula that obligates God to grant every selfish request that people make. 
No. Be careful how you use that. Be careful that you're using it well. Be careful that you're praying in the will of God. You see, to pray in Jesus' name has far more profound and serious meanings. First of all, it means to pray consistently with God's will and the purpose of, of God's kingdom. Do you remember how Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Matthew 6, verse 10 will remind you. Jesus, praying in the garden, said, May your kingdom come soon. He didn't ask for the kingdom of Israel to be restored. He didn't ask to make America great again. He didn't ask to be made great. He said, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Jesus actually is praying for the Father's will to be, be done ahead of his own personal will and ahead of his needs. When Jesus prayed according to what Luke wrote, he said, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Jesus was human. 100% man, 100% God. He was about to go to the cross. He knew it. He knew what he was about to face. Luke records that he sweat drops of blood because of, of the turmoil that was going on with inside of him because of all that he faced, sweating blood through the pores of his skin. As he prayed, he didn't pray Seriously, I mean, he, he prayed, you know, if there's any other way to redeem the loss of this world, if there's any way, other way for your plan to be carried out, you know, he prayed that way, but look at how he finished it. He said, if there's any other way, but if not, yes, I want your will, not mine. We need to be praying for God's will. You know, I... I confess to you that when I go to the hospital, a lot of times I, I used to struggle with that. Praying for people who were sick and laying in bed, needing to be healed. And, and, and I've learned to pray, Father, I, I, I know they want to be healed. And I know that's what we want. And, and, and I, I prayed that for my own father and my own mother and other people. I prayed that for my wife when she was in the hospital. But I also have learned to pray, not my will. But thy will be done because your will is best. Your will is perfect. You know what's best. You know what we need. It also means to pray in utter dependence upon God to supply every need that we have. It, it is a prayer that we pray uh, with, with a sincere desire for God's glory uh, to be seen in how he answers our prayer. Praying this way aligns our request with the Father's supreme goal to glorify his Son. That's the way the Apostle Paul prayed. Look with me, Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. Paul, in those last days of his life, said, At the moment, I, I have all that I need and, and more than I need. I, I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me through Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable to God and pleases Him. And this same God who takes care of me, notice what he says, will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us through Christ Jesus. Now glory be to God the Father forever and ever. Amen. I promise you this, God knows best. And God knows what he's doing. You may not understand it, but you can rest assured that you can trust him and find the comfort in him that you need. I, I was talking to Valerie the other day, and I've heard this from her more than once. Mr. Carl has been a very sick man, and in fact, earlier in the week, they didn't know if he was going to live another 24 hours. But I heard Valerie say this again. I don't understand what God is doing, and I confess I don't like what I see, but I trust that my God knows best. And I trust him. And I find comfort in that. I want to point you back to what Paul wrote in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. 
All praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of every mercy and the God who comforts us. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When, our, when others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. You can be sure that the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. So when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your benefit and salvation. For when God comforts us, it is so that we can in turn, uh, we, we in turn can be encouragement to, uh, to you. Then you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. Verse 7 says, we are confident that as you share in suffering, you will also share in God's comfort. I want to encourage you to do two things. This, this is my invitation this morning. I, I don't know what you're struggling with, but I want to encourage you to trust Christ in the midst of whatever's going on in your life and find comfort in him. I want you to praise him this morning, even in the midst of your struggle. Ronnie's going to come with our praise team in just a minute, and we're going to sing. I want you to praise God from the bottom of your heart. Give him the praise that he deserves. I promise you that will make a difference in your life. And I also want you to, to trust him for the comfort and the guidance that you need. Some of you got to make some decisions. Some of you have got to decide on what you're going to do next. I, I pray that you will trust and and, and ask him, what do you want me to do next? How do you want me to proceed with my life? What's next so that whatever choice I make will bring you the glory that you deserve? Will you do that with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you for being real and powerful, loving and kind gracious and merciful thank you lord for knowing us far better than we know ourselves thank you lord for knowing what we need thank you lord that life is temporary in this this world and that we have a future with you for all eternity thank you father for sending jesus who loved us enough to die for us who carried out the plan that you had prepared before the foundation of the world so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be made right with you. Thank you, Lord, that you bring us back into your family when we trust him as our Lord and Savior. I pray today, God, for those that are struggling, help us to praise you with all of our heart today, even in the midst of our storm. And God, help us to trust you with whatever we're dealing with. Help us to lay it at your feet and ask you, Lord, for the comfort that only you can give. I praise you, God. You're an awesome God. You're a loving God. You're a kind God. We need to celebrate your goodness, Lord, in the good times and also in the bad. Thank you for all that you are to us. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Let's praise God. Give Him the glory He deserves. Make decisions based on His will in our life. Trust Him for everything. You come as God leads. Jesus, draw me ever nearer as I live.
Jesus guide me through the tempest. Keep my spirit stayed and sure. When the midnight meets the morning, let me love.
All righty, you guys are dismissed then, if we have no other announcements, and we will have our Bible study in just a few moments, so be sure to find a Bible study class. You are.